always a pleasure to welcome back Cindy Fruin to Seeking Delphi. Cindy, how's it going? Hello, hello, Mark. How are you? Hope you're holding up all right in this crisis. Um, I, you are first and foremost an urban futurist, so we're talking about urban and social issues post COVID-19. Let's start with urban issues. And I'm going to start with the big picture. And the biggest picture is the 300 year trend we've had toward urbanization. Now the UN urbanization prospect report from a couple of years ago uh, cited statistics like this. In 1700, the global population was 5% urban. By 1900, with the industrial revolution, it had become 16% urban. Uh, that ex has only accelerated in the last 50, 75 years. It became 50% urban by 2007, is close to 55% now, and is projected to be, uh, as of 2018 anyway, was projected to approach 70% by 2050. But the big question for you is, is do you think, do you see scenarios ahead where this is going to going to change. Maybe people want more space. People are used, getting used to working remotely. How do you see this uh, playing out in terms of that trend? So Mark, that's a great question because I like the long-term aspect of it, this 300-year uh, trend. And in fact, we're getting to a sort of peak urbanization only because it trails, it lags peak, peak population. Peak population happens because, in part, uh, interactive with urbanization, education, and health. These things create an environment where people move to the city, quit having as many peop as many babies, and healthcare elongates our age. And so we age, but we don't have as high fertility. And the two balance out. And in this next century, we see a leveling off or even a decrease of uh, people. And urbanization is because, in part because there are so many people and that we don't have to be on the farm. And so there's a whole economic component to it. So it's a complex issue. It's across domains. Urbanization happens not as a driver, but as a outcome of, of, of other kinds of lifestyle issues and, and population. Um, it's all very interactive. It's a system. And... So will it uh, will it reverse? It doesn't reverse. It's already it's already finding a peak. There's places that are already starting to reverse in Europe and now China and Japan. They're starting to flatten because their populations are flattening. And as the populations flatten, you have fewer people moving into the cities because there's fewer people and uh, fewer new people. Right now, it seems to be more flattening. But by the end of the century, we see this uh, long-term trend towards uh, shrinking populations. And how do we then deal with that? And that's a whole different topic is we haven't ever done that before where we see we've never successfully shrunk, although we have shrunk. I mean, we, there's been other time periods where the population, where we depopulate and in part because of pandemics. Okay, uh, so you th perhaps uh, you think maybe COVID can impact this. I mean, I have heard a report that some realtors already re uh, uh, see people looking to move to less crowded areas. Even my millennial daughter, who swore to be an urban dweller her whole life, is suddenly wishing she had a little space. So um, is this going to be, a, a you think, a sharp uh, impact on, on the trend, or is it just a kind of a passing thing? So one of the things that happens with this more virtual society, uh, which I think is the long-term impact of COVID-19, is that the trend towards having more uh, online activities has been sped up tra traumatically. You know, instead of a slow climb, it is a sudden climb. It's a sudden change. Will it ever go back? Rubber band never goes back to the size it was, right? It gets stretched. And I think that's true in this case too, is that automation and uh, virtual uh, lifestyles are both going to be, digital lifestyles are going to be increased rapidly because of this intense pressure on it in just this few months. Because this is a, uh, a, a in, in terms of science, it is a 12 or 18 month cycle before vaccine. Uh, our behavior has changed dramatically already. We responded to that, and the people that have really taken the uh, 
brunt of the problems are the first responders and the workers who were stuck on the front lines unprotected. Uh, and now the healthcare system is is in a, a crisis stage because it wasn't planned. It wasn't planned for this kind of peak problem. So there is another thing that we have that we are not good at yet, and we will become better at is how do you deal with um, peak moments without building unnecessary infrastructure? And so how do you deal with the concept of suddenly we need all these ventilators, masks, and you know all the PPE uh, immediately, and all these extra beds? but what do we do about um, it afterwards? And how do we always have the right amount without the ventilator sitting and you know, going bad or go, going obsolete? You know, how, do, how do you keep it up to date? Well, we have to have faster, lighter responses combined with great networks and communication and um, the ability to act more quickly. Those are the sort of things that'll make us better at these, these sort of emergencies which are coming more and more frequently, not just because of pandemics, but because of other kinds of disasters as well. Getting into more specific urban issues, uh, mass transit is a major staple of large cities. Uh, and yet, as you can see, uh, people were packing into New York City subways, even as the, the COVID virus was just starting to occur in New York. And I wonder how this portends for the future of mass transit in cities and, and the future, future of cities as there, there isn't an easy way to get some of these large numbers of people around in the most crowded urban areas. So they've had a few of these ep epidemics in Asia in the last 20 years and have learned to be better at it than we are uh, because we haven't seen it as much, but they've learned uh, better health issues, um, but we're getting better automation. So maybe we don't have to touch all the same things. I mean, why is it that every single person has to touch the elevator buttons? Why is it that we all have to touch the doors as we come and go? These are things that are, that are easily remedied without, in touch-free manners. And, and why haven't we done that? Because it's a really automatic spread of germs. Um, so is it, are you safer in the suburbs or the urban, uh, rural areas versus the urban areas? Do the pandemics spread faster? Of course they spread faster because there's more people to spread to. But, the, um, but this pandemic in Italy, for instance, which is the, was the hotbed uh, until the United States is making everybody else look uh, like they've been brilliant um, in preparation by comparison, is that in Italy, it was because a uh, Wuhan engineer came from the um, car factory and went to a factory in Italy, which was also one suburb to another suburb, both of them industrial kind of level factories that were out in the exurb suburb area. And that is the beginning of this mess that they have in Italy. So Italy has not been, a, because they're all on subways, but it's because they um, were in areas where they happened to have industrial, uh, happened to have a car plant. And suddenly they got hit by a massive, surge without without protection, without preparation. So it was a combination of not thinking it was because of the location, but because it was mis, um, lack of communication and then lack prep, of preparation. These two things can solve a lot of the problems. Not that we don't need to also change our behaviors to be better at not spreading germs. Handshakes, for instance, kisses on the cheek. There's all kinds of ways we spread germs to people that we don't even know that well, right? We always shake hands or something and we always touch each other and that is something that may get less and less or right now it's stopped altogether. That may be the end of those kind of habits. Well, we'll kind of get into some of those broader social issues in a bit from the standpoint of, of uh, urban life though. Um, what about, um, do, do you see any uh, potential for future changes in urban design based on this, this global impact? I mean, it's only the second time, I think, in world history that we've had one 
uh, an epidemic globally of this impact. And of course, the last one, the, the world was only about 20% urban in 1918. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts about that? As I said, uh, I think I said earlier, is that I think it has to do with speeding up trends that were already underway. And suddenly all the attention is, how do we work from home better? How do we, how do we um, be more efficient? So we don't, we are, how, how do we take advantage of that? I see more people out on the streets because they, uh, with their kids in the middle of the day because the kids are not going to school. But that is not even, let's say, a healthy long-term lifestyle is that the kids are all at home, meaning they don't learn all the social processes that you would if you were at school. So there is a, maybe there becomes a better balance between when do you need to be with people and when should you be just using your own space at home, combined with why do we have all these unused spaces that are um, empty on the weekends and night times while we're all at home? Why have we compartmentalized our lives so much that we have to have these huge highways that are only totally occupied about one or two hours a day and the rest of the time? have a lot of empty space on them. We have a lot of heavy infrastructure in our cities that have been underused for years and years and years because of a very, let's say, awkward industrial era set of ideas about nine to five work Monday through Friday. Oops. <laughs> Excuse me there. So um, we're kind of segueing into more general social issues here. Um, and this is more of an issue in urban centers, but um, it's, to some extent all over. And that's simply crowds, crowded streets, yeah. um, museums, shopping centers, sporting events. Um, it, you know, clearly, um, uh, this stuff still existed after the 1918-1919 pandemic. Um, what do you think is going to happen with that? Are people going to be reluctant for years to come to, to go back to large gathering places? Or what's your, what's your take? I sure would be until there's a vaccine. I mean, it seems to me like that is a really critical element. Now, what are they going to do in the meantime? Uh, that's where uh, there could be some interim, very unusual uh, situations for trying to get people together, uh, there's a lot of people that don't even believe in it, right? And then will they then see these outbreaks? Will there be an outbreak, for instance, in places that decide to gather for Easter? And will they see then an, an uptick? In Kansas, there has been, uh, well, this is probably a few days ago, but there was 10 outbreaks and three of them were at churches. And the churches that continued to, ch to decide to meet and then one of them would be positive without even knowing it, right? Because that's the problem with this pandemic is that you test, you, you, if you haven't been tested, which most of us have not, is that you may be positive without exhibiting symptoms. And so you're spreading it innocently, but, um, and that's why we've all started being much more cautious with masks and such. So the long term has got to be science or we have to change a lot of things. If science can't answer this, which I don't know why it couldn't because it has before. And so uh, and there's many hopeful uh, solutions already on the horizon. It's not that this is so rare and unusual that they have no idea what to do. It's that it takes some time to test and make sure they're doing the right thing. And so it's not that this is so mysterious to them. It's just that it's new. It's novel and that it takes time for them to fix it. Now, is there going to be in the future quicker ways to respond to these things? I hope so, because 18 months, a lot of people and a lot of changes have to happen for this 18 months. And what if these become rolling? What if, it's, what if it mutates by the fall and it just continues to, to change on itself? Then we really get into, do we ever get to have huge gatherings or do we have to go with sort of uh, you know, with some sort of virtual gaming games and parties and everything else. I, I hope not because people do desire gatherings of la large gatherings. They flock to them and to not be able to do that. Um, I can see where we can make solutions to not overcrowding other places, but most people are getting this on the front lines of very everyday habits. And 
that is just the shopping and the uh, going about everyday life, work life, eating the basic things that we can't not do. And, uh, but, I, but there's so many changes happening at the level of deliveries, at the level of uh, how you work, how we, but how we play and socialize, that's where it gets really the optional gatherings is where the um, vaccines are gonna have to come into play if we're going to continue to have large sporting or music events. Well, uh, the suggestion of virtual reality is interesting because um, I'm trying to figure out how to maintain my conditioning. I play tennis two or three times a week and the indoor tennis club is closed. Uh, uh, you know, I've got a little bit of a home gym, but it's not the same thing. And I tried to buy a, an Oculus Quest and see that they're all sold out everywhere. So I'm curious what you think the role of, um, of virtual reality could be in the future. It certainly would, would be keeping us a little closer together at a time like this, uh, maybe a little bit better than Zooming. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is for the long run, uh, the, the impact is still to be determined, is it not? Well, one thing that's really clear is that the people that are most damaged are the ones that are the least healthy and uh, they have underlying conditions or they're really old. Um, but usually that includes you know, underlying uh, respiratory issues. And so being healthy is the first line of defense. And the, um, and the second line is personal hygiene, personal care against the germs yourself, you know, just as an individual then what can we do in terms of the system? Well, some of this has shown that people that are black and brown in America anyway, are being killed more far above their, the number of people that are in society, far above the statistics that they should be. And it's in part because they are the ones that are most exposed by virtue, they can't work at home. You can't, you know, you can't do some jobs at home. You have to be out in the public. And then they weren't well protected for that. And they had maybe underlying conditions and maybe they had to take the subway because they were so far distant from their job that they had to use uh, public transit to get there. Uh, all of these things add up to a disadvantage, the healthcare, the uh, kinds of jobs and the where they are in the city that causes them to be in the public uh, sphere when they shouldn't be. And it's it's an unfair disadvantage uh, that has happened and really, really something like a pandemic exposes the weaknesses of a society. And in this case, this thing that gets exposed is the um, is a combination of the healthcare emergency uh, and the and the and the um, the workers that get exposed. In terms of um, a kind of a, what we call a wild card as futurists, and maybe the public knows them as black swans, the sudden unexpected event that changes things radically. In my lifetime, I see that there have only been really two almost instantaneous events that caused the degree of, of social and political and whatever economic change that this is going to. And I would call those the, the JFK assassination and the 9-11 terrorists attack. And I'm wondering if you see how you see this in comparison um, to that. Obviously, the after effects of this look like they're going to be ongoing effects are going to be more sustained, but it has been a very sudden change. And I wonder if you see any, any parallels uh, and, and distinct differences. So what JFK, you would say that civil rights, uh, the end of the uh, Vietnam War, that entire social change era of the 60s, one of my favorite topics, uh, the moonshot, right? All of these things happened out of a JFK um, sort of a, a ripple effect from his presidency and assassination. The, um, and so those are still unfolding, right? They still have an influence on American life at any rate. Um, the 9-11, uh, we became more aware of security and terrorism. And that again, was that was global. That was a very global impact uh, com compared with uh, JFK. And so, <clears throat> but became, has been more of an impact on the US, I think, because I've been overseas on 9-11 and, uh, and other people don't even maybe mention it. And on September 11th, 
uh, we're um, we're still very involved. Very, it's very present um, in America's life. So the but the terrorism and those security threats going through the airports and the kind of things that you get into metal detectors at any all kinds of places. Uh, all of these have been global. These are these security issues have happened. Again, it's another issue of so many people close together. And and how how can you be safe from people that are um, are not are, are terrorists or uh, in some way you know mentally unstable? So <clears throat> what would this have to do with? Seems to me it's on healthcare and on a uh, combination of healthcare and virtual automation, virtual slash automation. That reality is getting sped up, and uh, I think. Some of it will be very permanent. I think our, we're all going to be more aware of germs here, as they have been in Asia already. Um, will we be better at responding? Will they actually uh, have a better health? Health. Um, I mean, we have enough beds. It's not our problem. We have a lot of uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, they may not be at the right place. It was really equipment where we showed, but we never would have gotten it to the point that we could have. 325 million people wearing masks every day, right? We never would have had that level. Uh, at some point, it, it becomes an individual effort because that's how you can aggregate faster. Um, so there is, the, I can, all of these things could be permanent changes. We will be more cognizant here in America about germs and about spreading germs. I think those will make behavioral changes. I'm hoping it will make a ch some changes in how inefficient our cities are and making them work more function towards a new age as opposed to function towards an industrial age, which they are. We, we live in our parents' cities. We didn't design them, we live in them. And we're uh, stuck with these things that were designed in the 50s and 60s for a different kind of lifestyle than what we necessarily need now. And this may cause us, may force us to become to think it through because the old way was very unsustainable and very uncomfortable in many ways. There's parts of it that were adjusting already. Uh, virtual teams were becoming quite common in certain kinds of industries. Uh, but rethinking, when do you have to come together and when don't you in terms of work? How can you get your shopping done without, you know, uh, Maybe in the future, these these grocery stores will primarily be fresh produce, and the rest of it comes to you shipped on a regular basis. Uh, and it's 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 possible that that uh, the way that we shop and the way that we work are changed dramatically. The thing that really, as I said before, becomes up for grabs is how do we socialize and play, because that is optional. That is uh, by choice, but people like to get together. To see the closing of museums, I just, that would be so sad. Uh, maybe more people will see, will have access to them virtually, but still seeing things in person, being able to travel to Italy. I mean, we have to be able to see Italy in person. You can't just hear about it or read about it, or even they see it in uh, 3D glasses. It's just not the same. It is a, it is a spatial experience that uh, has to be a, uh, seen in a tangible way. We're tangible human beings. We just can only go so far virtually. And at some point we make those choices and then how do you make those choices safely? Um, I think people will be thinking about it twice. The ships, I don't know about the cruise ships. Those, those have a long way to go to repair the damage. And, uh, you know, being on an airplane that has got all this recycled air, um, that also is gonna have an entire review of how it works. Buildings are gonna have that kind of review of their va ventilation and their clean air um, issues. You know, more, more sustainable buildings tend to have, help, be healthier. And being healthier usually means you have operable windows and less mechanics and that you've used all the passive kinds of uh, means that we had forgotten about when we sort of created these, um, these self-contained boxes. And, um, and so how do, we, how do we take advantage in that regard? I mean, you can see that there could be benefits. 
Okay, well, one last question here. We've kind of compared this uh, crisis to some past wild cards within our lifetime, but let's go back to the the prototype for this, the 1918 Spanish flu. I'm wondering, have you at all looked at that and looked at the aftermath and is there stuff from that that we can learn even not so much in terms of managing it now because there, there are five times as many people in the planet now um, news is instantaneous people travel more now but in terms of managing the aftermath uh, is there have you looked at that and is there anything we can learn in, in terms of our future uh, response and our, our urban design social change what is yeah, so that Spanish flu was massive, right? And it happened on the heels of World War I. In fact, some people would say that it started in Kansas and that it was then taken over to France, taken over to Europe. They only call it, I guess, the Spanish flu because this, Spain was not involved in World War I, it was sitting it out and was reporting on this, whereas other countries were suppressing the information. So sharing information on this pandemic has been crucial to stopping it and to um, making us learn to social distance and to wash our hands and to keep our hands off our face. The things that are um, you know, behavioral and immediate because the uh, health system uh, had some gaps, uh, had some shortages. And uh, so how do you even stop it in the first place? Well, they didn't have any of that in the Spanish flu, and it was a massive, I think it changed our, in America, I think the uh, life uh, expectancy changed by, I don't know, eight or 10 years in a year because of it. I mean, it was really massive compared to what we're having here, where the massiveness is in our behavior changes, not in the uh, level of the pandemic at this point is that the numbers of the pandemic have been controlled compared to what they could have been if it was this 1918. And that's because of our communications and our ability to make changes immediately. This is, you know, you know, it's a little bit of the Y2K phenomena is that it, if it didn't kill you, did it really happen? You know, if it didn't, if it didn't destroy our life expectancy, was it really a pandemic? And yet, um, it's because of our behavior changes. We did it ourselves. It was an action that they weren't able to do then. They didn't even, people weren't even sharing between countries how big of a problem they had. And so then they continued to spread it in the Spanish flu. And so a very different uh, set of uh, healthcare uh, priorities. They, they just weren't uh, in the same mindset yet of how do you stay healthy? Not to mention the idea of being healthy in the first place, which is the best defense against these flus. Well, one additional thing I'm going to comment, and I'll, I'll, if you want to add to this, please do. But mentioning Y2K, that kind of showed that with foresight, we could solve a problem and not be, you know, before it occurred. Now that was something much more concrete. We knew what it was. We knew when it was going to happen. I heard people complain that all this bug hubbub, nothing happened. Well, nothing happened because everybody worked to fix it before it occurred. And uh, it's a lesson that, that society's got to learn for wild cards as well as the predictable stuff like Y2K. I, I think it's the, the lack of foresight in, in the U.S. and other countries has been the biggest problem. Yeah, well, one of the things to note in this is things not to do. And one of them not to do is to see this as us versus them. For instance, uh, you know, in either political or urban suburban or uh, urban rural or uh, East Coast center, coastal center versus center, all of these things that you can start parsing out and saying, well, it's their problem and my, it's everyone's problem. So that's the first piece. We're learning from each other. And so making this in a learning event, as opposed to a fearful event, um, that seems to be the, the key to making us move ahead and, and actually come out as, as uh, more safe, uh, more health conscious, more um, thoughtful society. Making it so that it's not just one domain, so that it's economic versus health. That's another 
us versus them problem. And that isn't true is because the reality is it's really become both. And it's all of these other things too. It's population, it's urbanization, it's across domains. It's a, it's a, it's a global problem. And, uh, and so it's what, what not to learn, what do we want to learn? Uh, it's not to isolate and permanently because people need people and don't leave people alone just because we have to be in these social distancing moments because being alone during this time period is a very worrisome, anxious situation. And you know, mental illness is real, loneliness is real. And so how you can reach out to people and uh, you see pictures of it, you see images and stories about it every day. And so what are the stories we come out of with this? Um, I've been just completely entertained by some of the memes that happen uh, on Twitter and such, uh, you know, ramen's your best friend and, and uh, uh, what day of the week is it? And all of the home work, working at home issues that uh, others of us that have done this for years now are very familiar with, which is, you know, the, it's not funny every night if you shut your computer and say, honey, I'm home. After some point, it's not funny anymore because, <laughs> you know, the computer pops right back open later. But it's these kind of things, I think, affect the culture and they affect our habits and our rituals and eventually our stories about who we are. And so how do we come out of it with a with stories about how we did a better job than we could have, but the things that we could have learned in terms of preparation earlier and in being ready, we really, we really have some things to learn on that. Well, thank you, Cindy. Uh, your insights always uh, very, uh, very perceptive, and it's always a pleasure to have you here. And thanks once again for um, for joining us. All right. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>